Any, any general reflections on that? Before I move on, any general reflections on what I've just said? Yeah. It's not quite general, it's an example. I had this situation yesterday, but in a personal relationship with my partner, where he said something that triggered me. I got upset about it, and we started to have a debate about the topic. Oh. And afterwards, when we calmed it down, he actually said to me, actually, what we should have talked about was the fact that you were triggered, and then I reacted right. to the trigger and got defensive. Great. But what we ended up talking about was the content of the fact that I thought he made quite a racist comment and I was really upset by that. Mm. Which didn't move us on because... Because you got locked into the content. Right. And, and that was kind of academic because we were both in our positions. I guess my observation is if we had a gone into the relationship, we could have broken it down and understood why we were reacting that way. Right, nice. But because we put aside the trigger and what was happening relationally, couldn't really get any deeper. Yeah, great, great. So let's move into coaching. What are the four components of coaching? This is, no, that's me, that's a mean question, because you can come up with a totally different form. You'd be right. And I say, no, you're wrong. So let me give them to you, as I see them. One is the, the client. We don't accept there has to be a client for, for um, coaching. Two is the coach. Three is the relationship that exists between you. And four is the system. The system that they exist within, the system you exist within. So that guy's reaction to my working with somebody who's on the verge of suicide is a systemic response because he's part of the coaching world. My question to the group at the time was, if I lived 10,000 years ago, before psychotherapy, before coaching, before counseling, what would be different? What would, what would really change? We only call it ethical, ethically wrong or ethically right because we, we professionalize it with what we describe as boundaries of our profession. But actually, if we step out of that, we can say, okay, so what's the system that's influencing how we're showing up here? So we have the client, we have the coach, we have the relationship, but we have the system too. Make sense? Yeah. So when we start to look at the fractal nature of coaching, we need to look at all four aspects. And here's where most coaches go wrong. They only look at the client. Here's what, well, the, kind of my, main, my main message from tonight is when you walk away from here, start to look at all four aspects, the client, yourself, the relationship, and the system. Because it's a fractal of everything. But it's a fractal that can be disrupted given the right tools, if you like. Um, Rafa, did you have a question? Um, no, what thoughts came to my mind around that was um, being a bit like a leader and a follower. Because when you're following somebody, you know, you can be leading, um, but you can also be Yeah, that's nice. It's rather like the, the analogy I would use later about the dance floor on the balcony. Is that sometimes as a coach we get locked into the dance. I won't do a dance up here. But we get locked into the dance. So we're on the dance floor of the client. And we're, we're doing the waltz, or we're doing the jig, or we're doing the tango, or we're kind of just, we're just doing this by ourselves. Because we feel a bit more comfortable. Like do a bit goal setting, a bit grow model, you know. So we're locked in the dance floor, and what we can do is step up onto the balcony and go, ah, oh, what's happening down there? What is the system here? What is the relationship here? What's the coach there, and what's the client there? And how do I look at the whole thing and affect change through that? And we'll take a look at this in more detail shortly. Now, I just want to also bring in this notion of what I call the binary versus the unitary perspective on this, or the principle, which is when we look at it as a binary sort of status, if you like, or a binary kind of um, <clears throat> approach. We're looking at one individual and another, operating together, but nonetheless separate. When we look at the unitary principle, we look at them as a system together, coach-client system, which exists as a one. I don't mean that in some spiritual way. Most of you know me, know that I wouldn't go into woo-woo. It's just not who I am. So I don't mean that we exist in one. Like I meld with your DNA for an hour. I don't mean that. I just mean that you, you, you form a unit in that moment in which things happen, and they're unique to you. Nobody else can be that unit, un that unit with that person. So we can look at the relationship in a unitary way, rather than in a binary way. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let's get a little bit, a little more detailed. When I talk about the fractal nature of coaching, I'm talking about the different aspects we might explore. We could explore the cognitive fractal. What is the thinking pattern that the client, that you, and that you as a partnership, and that the system holds to be true, such that it repeats itself here, here, 
here, and also here, here, and here. Make sense? So the more detailed you get, the more you'll find that cognitive pattern repeating itself through and through and through, no matter how detailed you get, because it's a fractal. Equally, the bigger you go, you'll see that cognitive pattern repeating itself because it's a fractal. So how is that person's cognitive, cognitive patterns affecting not just their situation, but their situation within the situation, but also the system as a whole? How is that cognitive functioning a fractal? It may not be, by the way. The question for us as coaches is, am I seeing a fractal here? Am I seeing a repeating pattern that is both large and small all the way through? Can I just check the few knots of the head that's making sense? Um, so we might look at the, the uh, cognitive fractal. We might look at the affective fractal, the emotional fractal. I was talking to, to Rob only today, and we were talking about uh, some clients that we've seen recently, and he said it's really interesting how they're always angry all the time. So what is that affective fractal, in which anger shows up through their system, through their big system, through their coaching process, through themselves in that moment, through, the, through their life? Do you notice it in yourself? Do you find that when you work with them, you get angry? Either on their behalf or at them. Like, God, that's so annoying, they're always angry. Really annoying me, they're angry all the time. Like, how much are we part of that fractal? We'll take a look at that with this concept called parallel process shortly. I haven't got a clue what the time is, because I'm not watching it. That's it, it's 8 o'clock, we're good. Um, we might look at the outcomes fractal. Fascinating, outcomes fractals are fascinating. What is the outcome saying through the system? So they always get this kind of result, or they always get that kind of result. And what is that saying about the fractal they're living in? The repeating pattern they're living in? Maybe they're, you know, I've told this story a few times because it was just so funny to me. Funny in a, funny in a kind of sad way, human, humanly tragic. In fact, forget it funny, it's tragic. <laughs> it's totally tragic. Which was a, a friend of mine um, was a, was a, a um, merchandiser. And she never was happy in a job. She was always stressed, and she always, always, always fell out with her boss. But she always knew that if she got the next job up, it would all change. So she said to me, Nick, if I could just get that senior, junior, minion merchandiser role, I'll be so happy. And then she'd get the job, she'd get a pay rise, two, three thousand quid, and she'd be like, yes, I'm so happy. Two weeks later, she fell out with her boss. She wasn't unhappy in her role, and she's like, why don't I just get that next promotion? I'm not joking, one day she was talking to me about it, and I said to her, you don't really believe I can listen to the story and, and treat the story as itself, because this is a pattern, and I have to look at the pattern, not the story. Yes, every time you tell me that story, I can say, yeah, I can't deny your boss is an idiot, I can't deny that you've really, really worked hard, I can't deny you deserve the money, but if it happens that many times, you're in a fractal. So we can look at the outcome fractal. We can look at the structural fractal. What is the structure of their experience? Or indeed, what is the structure of the coaching? Here's a fascinating one. I was supervising somebody recently, and I listened to three of their recorded sessions. And what I noticed is every session had the same intrinsic structure. It started like this. Uh, let me go this way, because that, that's the past for you, isn't it? This is my future, that's your past, so I'll work with you. Here's the past. Like, starts the session, hey, how are you doing? Where have you been? Go on holiday? Yeah, I've gone on holiday. Warm, 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 friendly, friendly, friendly. So, what do you want to talk about? Moan, 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 Blame everyone, blame everyone, blame everyone, blame everyone, blame everyone. Till about halfway through the session. All the way through this bit, the coach is like, hmm, yeah, can't believe it. Really colluding in the client's model of the world. Story. Until halfway through, when he would ask the most impeccably good question. That showed me he wasn't at all buying into the story. But he sort of emotionally colluded all the way through that first half because it kind of felt good. Then he asked this amazing question. She goes super deep, like this is how it went deep, right? <laughs> but he's a bit scared that he can't deal with the debt. So he says, actually, let's just look at the pros and cons. And she goes, oh. <laughs> And he goes, and then he kind of finishes off on this really light note around pros and cons, action planning, detail, lots and lots and lots of detail. So tell me, was that five things you're going to do or six? I, I've lost count. I've got, one, two, three, four, five, you've got six, I've got five, I can't believe it, how did I go wrong on that one? <laughs> then it came to an end, that's the tip. The structure is basically the same. Forget the content, the structure is the same. You guys are lost, I didn't say this, but I said, you guys are lost in a fractal of structure. And until you break the fractal, you just repeat the same old structure, forever and ever and ever, amen. So let's break the fractal in order to release, because it said possibilities, you Jade said the possibilities. We need to release the possibilities by fracturing that fractal. 
Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Fractal to fractal. That's my new. That's my kind of like my manifesto. <laughs> yes. Yes. Question. You talked yeah. about um, the structure within a coaching session, yeah. and how does the structure with a client outside the coaching session? How might you might you recognise that, or how might that matter? Well, your example there of you and your partner, I said it would be a great structural fractal. If you told me that you fell out with your friend, and this is how it happened, and you fell out with your boyfriend, and this is how it happened, you fell out with your boss, and this is how it happened, I was like, kind of a similar pattern there in terms of how you fall out with people. We could say that's a fractal, a structural fractal. Because it's, it's the same thing repeating itself. Wherever you look, it's the same pattern. Repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating itself. The last way you can look at it is a relational fractal which is the relationship between you and the client, or the relationship between the client and the boss, or the relationship between the client and you, you and your partner, you and your, whatever it might be. What is the relational fractal that's being formed between you and that you both bring to the party? Does that make sense? It's so the relational thing. Now, one of the things we'll get into quite a lot shortly is how you really harness the relationship in the room. Too often, I think, as coaches, we talk about the stuff, the client stuff. Now, what is it you're talking about? What happened? How might you do it differently? What is it you really want? No, that's great. I'm not disputing that's great stuff. But it's only one part of it. It's also the bit that goes, what am I? What am I feeling? What am I experiencing? What am I bringing in for this? And that's part of the fractal. So one of the things that um, I guess I'd like to to phrase it is to build what so Peggy's back there, and she always says. You have a really strong meta view of stuff, as I do, and I think there's a there's there's a strength in building a meta view. This is the idea of stepping onto the balcony. Let's step out of the dance floor and take the meta view. So instead of going, tell me more about the goal. Tell me more about the challenge. Tell me more about the 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 the, 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 the um, problem. So let's look at the let's look at the structure of it. Let's look at the structure of that thing and take a meta view. And that meta view frees up this kind of space to explore possibilities. Okay, so, everyone okay with what a fractal is and how it shows up in coaching in some way? If you're Neo and you want to see those numbers, now everyone watch, hands up who's watched Matrix? Who's not watched Matrix? Shame on you. <laughs> okay, great, so, not shame on you, really? Good. So, um, so how did Neo managed to see the matrix for all those numbers? <laughs> how did Neo see? He stepped out of it. He stepped out of it. He took the pill, which took him deeper down the rabbit hole, and he was able to step out of the matrix. In other words, to step out of the fractal, sorry, to, to notice the fractal, you've got to be out of it. It's a bit like the old Chinese proverb that says, the last things to, be, to know about water are fish. The last things to know about water are fish. Because they're in it. They don't know it's like not to be a water. And when we're in a fractal, when we're in a fractal, we don't know it. So our job is to know it. Our job is to see it. Our job is to, to experience it for what it is and then step out. So how do we do that? First of all, I would say start, stop, uh, stop controlling and start noticing. Stop controlling. And some of you will say, I don't control. I am I'm a coach, I have no agenda. But I would say to you, really notice how you practice and notice where you try at some level to manage your client. If you're managing your client, you're controlling. Typically because it triggers something in you. If they're late or if they if they don't give you the kind of response they're under, they don't do the kind of things they, they, that you expect them to, it triggers a response in you. Potentially of inadequacy, potentially of frustration, potentially of I'm not good enough, all that kind of stuff. And we take it out on the client unconsciously by trying to control them. So instead of doing that, let's step away from control and start noticing. A great example of that was a, a client who I worked with maybe three years ago who was really, really desperate to work for me. She, she had a big, big, big issue. <coughs> and uh, she, she been a, uh, some of you might know this story, but she'd been an escort uh, and she wanted to split up from her boyfriend who had kind of encouraged her to become an escort and she wanted to split up with him um, in what she said as an angry free way, like free of anger. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll work with you. 
and she was desperate, desperate, desperate to work for me. And on the first session, she turned it half hour late. Now, a lot of people would have that response of like, I can't believe it. You spent all this time convincing me to work with you. No, I do. And you're half hour late. It's like you're wasting my time. There's that, there's that little subtle bit of us that can have that response. But instead, it's like, no, that's information. What does that say? And I asked that question. It's really interesting to me that knowing that you want to work with me, you're half hour late for the first session. Let's just explore what that's really saying about your experience. What's that saying about this journey we're going to go on together, rather than huh, interpret, interpretation? We notice we don't control. Sorry. I'm fascinated about what it did tell you. I, I've actually forgotten what it did now. It did tell me something, but it's a long time ago. <laughs> next talk, June. So, um, <laughs> next up is really tune into everything you can see, hear, and feel. And if you have other sensory things, do that as well. Intuition, spirituality, whatever it might be. But really tune into all aspects of what we might think of as the Gestalt field. You all aware of the Gestalt field? Ish. So the Gestalt field is the, is the whole field of experience that we encounter. At any given moment, we're only focusing on that bit there. In this case, you're focusing on me, or you're focusing on what we're going to eat when you get home, or you're focusing on when do we finish the talk and go for a glass of wine. It's up to you. What do you focus on is up to you. But you've got some kind of figure. And yet all around you, there's stuff. There's other people, there's the walls, there's the lights, there's the pictures, there's everything. That's the Gestalt field. And the more you tune into every aspect of that Gestalt field and really become open to it all, the broader will be your coaching impact. The stronger will be your ability to notice. So become attuned to things rather than focused on things. That make sense? Yeah. So I had a colleague who had an issue with my line manager. And I witnessed it. And the monk said, that's kind of what's happening. And I said, what is it in him that's true with something? She said, I have got a problem with women in authority who are like spiders because it reminds me of my dad. And she then went to that issue because I said, wherever you go in your life, you're going to meet people like him because you're going to through your belief system, whatever mm. your pattern is. So is that of the similar sort of vein? It's, and it, if you see a pattern, is it then going, where's that come from? Or? Very much so. I said, but here's the thing, what I want to get to as we go to the next half hour is this idea that you're part of the fractal. Never forget that. You're part of that fractal. You are co-constructing a fractal experience. So the way you describe it sounds like you're outside it, which is great because you, you can be. But it's also very possible to be in it without knowing it. And, and, and so it's a great way to notice what's being triggered in you, such that you find what's being triggered in them. Yeah, because well, I could relate to it as well. Great. That's why I saw it. Yeah. And then I talked about my experience, because I'm on coaching at the moment, to help, and she read I need to sort it, and she has gone and sorted it. Perfect, yeah. So I kind of led by example. Yeah. So you were able to step out of the fractal in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Would it be also that at some point, at some level, you sharing the same values with that person believes? Maybe, maybe not. But it might be you collude in their values without knowing it. There's a, one of the, you know, one of the, fast, the things I'm really fascinated by at the moment is the, it's like the politics of coaching. Uh, and an awful lot of stuff around coaching is about the normative assumptions we bring into it. You know, that, that progress is clearly something we should be aiming for, and that goal setting is clearly good, and having problems is bad, and whatever it might, whatever it might be, we bring in sort of social normative assumptions. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm not saying they're wrong. It's just that we have to be careful when just not colluding with a normative assumption, rather than actually allowing a client to fully express themselves, rather than be normalized. Does that make sense, everyone? that we, we unwittingly bring in normative assumptions, what we call, I call the politics of coaching. And there was something I was going to share with you, but I'm not sure how you, yes, it's useful, I think. Can you just repeat the question um, that um, you asked? What has been triggered in you when, I mean, I mean this is the half of that question. Yeah, so, well, I'll come to that now, actually. Oh, okay. so we're going to talk about parallel process. So my, my basic question, Rafa, is what's being triggered in you that may be a response to what's being triggered in them? Yeah, what's been triggered in you that may be a response to what's been triggered in them? So in other words, there's a good chance that what's constructed inside you is, a, is simply a response to what's been constructed in them. And I'll share more about that right this second. <laughs> so there's no flip charts. You've got to imagine a flip chart. Um, there's a, there's a, this, so I, I said to you that this part two is, how do you notice the fractal? And so one way is to become a really, really great reflective practitioner. 
and then to really start thinking through what's going on for you in your coaching. And there's a couple of models I'd like to share with you. The first is called the seven-eyed model of supervision. Anyone come across a seven-eyed model of supervision? It's a really effective way to look at it. You don't even need a supervisor for this. Well, you sort of do for some of the eyes, but... So basically, it works like this. I want... So you can imagine these eyes are lenses. And you just kind of slot them on, and we can look at the experience through these given lenses. I want is the client. Who is the client? What is their personal experience? What's their challenge? What's going on for them? What's their emotional response and all that kind of stuff? What's, who is the, the client in this situation? And so, <coughs> so often we spend a lot of time looking at the client. You know, we bring the client in and go, yeah, yes, the, the client wants this and they want this and we're kind of all focused here. Even in the coaching, our, our focus is there, isn't it? Let's be honest. So then number two, that the eye we might look at next, which is less relevant to this work, is the intervention that you're using. Which is, what did you actually do for the client? One might explore, what was your process in working with the client? You know, you might have used the STAR model, or you might have used the perceptual positions, or you, you might have just done person-centered work, whatever it might be, but you can say there's an intervention of some kind that you've thrown into the system with the client. That's I2, so you look at I2. I3 is you, the coach. What's happening for you, the coach? What is, what is your internal experience? What feelings do you have? What cognitions do you have? What senses do you, are you feeling? What is your personal experience in the moment? And then we can go I4, which is the, the, the emerging relationship between you and the client. Now when we look at those four eyes, the client, the intervention, you and the relationship, we can start to take a step back from the here and now moment of coaching the client to say, actually, I noticed that when I was coaching this person, I felt this anxiety, this, I felt this excitement, I felt this boredom, I felt this whatever. And we start to tune in much more to our own personal experience in the moment. Rather than, I'll, like, I'll give you an example. I was working with a, a, a coach recently in supervision, and um, she shared with me that she had, it always gets confusing when you have multiple people, but she had a client Who's another person whose husband was very controlling. Uh, he, he was controlling the money and he was controlling her sort of financial well being. And she had a similar experience in her life. And it really impacted her to hear the client speaking about the same thing. It really triggered an emotional response. And she said, Nick, I didn't know what to do. She said, I knew I should have parked it. You know what I mean by parking it? It's like, that's my stuff. Put it over there. Let it alone. I knew I should have parked it, but I wasn't sure how, so I just kind of fought my way through it, asking questions. I said, okay, well, one way is to park it, particularly in traditional coaching, we said, you know, don't let the human being get into the room. <laughs> park, your, park your stuff, it's your stuff. But I said, what else might you have done with that? And she said, could I have done, I mean, she wasn't quite like this, so she didn't turn and go, could I have done something with it? But just for, just for a dramatic effect in this room tonight, she went, could I have done something with it? <laughs> And I, and I said, well, let's explore that. What have you done? She said, well, I could have shared it. I could have shared what, what it triggered in me. And so we explored, what would it have been like to actually share her personal experience of this thing? And what might that have created as a journey of, of conversation for the coaching client? Make sense? Now, as we get further up the, the chain, we, we bring a supervisor in, we can then say that the next eye is the supervisor. And here's where it gets really interesting. Because you can still do the same even as a, as a coach. You can bring the supervisor in and say, if I feel something here, or here, or wherever, maybe you're feeling it too. And if you're feeling it, maybe your client's feeling it too. Is it something that's in the system? Is it something that's in the system? And if so, we're experiencing what, what uh, Harold Searles in 1955 called a parallel process. And it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating phenomenon. It's where the, the energy or the pattern or behaviors from one place gets sort of sent up the ladder into another place. So the system has maybe a very demanding desire for outcomes. So the client has a very demanding desire for outcomes. The coach then goes to the supervisor has a very demanding desire for outcomes. And the supervisor's at the end of this going, wow, I feel a real strong expectation for outcomes here. Where's that coming from? It might not be from me. It could be from there. And that could be from there, and that could be from there. So we can look at the whole thing as a systemic fractal that the pattern of demanding an outcome is actually replicated through the system, not just here in me. 
Well, it might be that it's just here and me. It might be I've got some really big deal about having to get an outcome. But let's explore it. If I've got an emotional feeling, what if it's not me? What if it's out there? What if I'm being triggered by the system? And if so, we can actually use that feeling that we get as coaches to step out of the fractal. Say, so that's weird. Where's that feeling coming from? Where's that stress coming from? Where's that desire for an outcome coming from? Where's that urge to clarify coming from? A lovely example, a really simple example, was I was, I was supervising somebody a while back. <clears throat> I was listening to her session, and it was, as clients do, they bombard you with a whole lot of stuff, don't they? Who, who's, who's ever had a client that's bombarded them with a whole lot of stuff? <laughs> who's, who's not had a client ever that's bombarded you with a whole lot of stuff? Fabulous, two of you, brilliant. Two and a half. So a lot of clients, they kind of just go, don't they? And we're like, whoa. And the coach's urge, very often, is what? Just slow it down. Listen. Try and uh, articulate some of you know, all the different bits of the experience to try and make sense of it. You know? Right. Rather than looking at it maybe in the top and get stuck and think, you know, get the vibes that are coming from that. Brilliant. That makes sense. It makes total sense. So what Ken's saying, I don't know if you guys can hear it at the back, but what Ken's saying is that a tip some coaches might typically try to slow it down. What is that an example of that I should talk about earlier? Control it. This is an example of control. It's like, hold on, let's slow it down. You're affecting the system. That's not a bad thing. But just be aware that by doing that, you are affecting the system. You're not, you're not understanding the system. You're affecting the system. You're not understanding any deeper. You're just controlling the system at that point. Instead, what Ken's suggesting is we actually allow it to come out and notice what it produces in us. Because that then allows us to to, to find what's going on for us. So here's the thing, that when I was supervising this coach, she did exactly what a lot of coaches do. She didn't so much slow it down, she went like this. So, if I can just summarize where we're at. What I'm hearing are there are three buckets. In one bucket there's, I can't even remember the content, it was boring content. Most stuff is boring content, let's be honest, isn't it? I mean, most stuff is boring content. It's, like, it's, it's, it's the life you live around the stuff that makes it interesting. So she went, boring bucket one is this. <laughs> Boring bucket two is that. Boring bucket three is that. And I got that right. And the client was, oh yes, that was great, just what I needed, clarification. <laughs> but that, that's, that's, that's okay, by the way, there's nothing wrong with it as a style of coaching. But it misses one really critical aspect, which is what was the urge in you that made you feel you needed to clarify? What if instead of doing the clarification, we explored, well, I'm feeling a really strong need to clarify? Before I do that, where might that be coming from? My client says, because I'm as confused as you. So instead of doing the work for the client, we use the experience of the client to find out what it's really like to be that client. Yeah, 